Cashamaniacs. Gearheads. Hey, Cashamaniacs, this is Will I Be Ready from Northern Lower Michigan. Just wanted to thank you guys for the show. Uh, head, heart, hat, love the videos on YouTube. Um, you guys are doing a great job with this. Keep it coming. There's a new guy getting into the sport. I really appreciate uh, all the good info. Thanks. Have a great day. You're very welcome, Will I Be Ready, and thanks for that feedback. I'm Daryl W4, back for the 48th edition of the Geo Gearheads, as usual, with the Bad Cop. This is our seventh randomized show and the drawing for some great guests. We've got a packed show this time. And to kick things off, we've got one quick correction before we dig in. The, in the last episode, Head Hard Hat incorrectly referred to a Samsung ad as having been from Apple. We'll include a link in the show notes to that humorous Samsung video on YouTube for those who might not have seen it. Yeah, it was quite amusing and well worth a little chuckle. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we're going to do uh, something very unusual this time, and that's we're going to do back-to-back -back randomized shows since we've received so many comments thanks to the uh, drawing this week. So next week we'll have the eighth randomized show, and you can still call in uh, comments and questions, tips, or just about anything else that you'd like uh, to that 206-350-3647. You can email them to geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com or drop us a comment through social media outlets. And we even set up a new profile on the new cashface.com for those who are uh, on that service and want to give it a shot. You know, I've been messaging with the developer of Cashface, and we hope to get them on, the future, on a future show. So all of those who submitted their feedback for the show, whether it makes it into this one before we break or not, it has been dropped into the box and their names are in the drawing Four, there they are. For the Magellan Explorers GC, the Geomate Junior, caches, and several other great gifts for geocachers. We'll have that drawing after we've tackled the feedback on the previous shows. So, let's get into our first comments. And our first one actually comes from uh, Lafitte. FL of Florida, and that came to us via email, and he wrote in, you recently had W or VW, actually, I think that's supposed to be WV Tim, wasn't it? WV Tim from West Virginia. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, okay, so D WV Tim on uh, beta episode 41. His gadget caches sound great, but I never figured I'd get near them. Then came Hurricane Sandy, heading, up to, uh, heading to upstate New York for Thanksgiving with the family. We decided it best to avoid New Jersey and went up through West Virginia on I-81. We spent a couple of nights there, and remembering his caches were in West Virginia, I wondered if any were close. Turns out the library, GC2WCV0, was right next door to our hotel. Next morning, we did this gadget cache. It was amazing, really well done. We knew we had to get a few more. That same day, we did gadget cache, GC333J2, featured on your show. Widget, GC2WX5B, was also awesome, and two of his non-gadget caches that were also pretty neat. Thank you for having him on, as we'd never known about his caches. I can highly recommend them for anyone nearing the area. How cool is that? Hurricane Sandy actually helped somebody find a great cache. Indeed it was, and you know, I, I'm jealous because I want to go hit some of those caches myself. I do too. And I'm right here in Seattle near uh, Dayspring, and I still haven't found his caches. But talking of Dayspring... WV Tim, hey, we just talked about him, of West Virginia, said uh, via email, love GeoGearhead Beta 46, totally tubular with Dayspring, but you knew I would. The man knows his stuff and really does think outside the ammo can. Great show. He has some great ideas. Just to give you an update, since uh, the show several weeks ago, my home DVR is filling up. Why, you may ask? I'm not getting any time to watch TV. I spend my nights sending out plans and answering questions on gadget caches. I'm having a ball sending out plans and pics of some of my caches for others to build. I've had a lot of cachers take me up on the offer to provide some details on how to build a couple of the caches we talked about. Thanks for having me on your program. And WV Tim, it was our honor, to be honest. 
It was, and I'm hoping that some of those people that uh, he's writing to are in this area, and you know, we'll get some of those type of caches out here. And I'm secretly but, hoping they're on the West Coast. Well, yeah, some of them can be out there too. You know, okay, good. Yeah, you know, we could have everyone all over the world start entering those in, and that, I'd love to see a lot of that kind of stuff. I would now, too. one of the things that I really would like though is for more different types of caches. So if you know someone who's doing something really interesting, like I saw a video today on building your own uh, Cryptex cache. You know, if you mm-hmm. know someone who's doing that kind of stuff that you think should be on our show, you know, drop us a line and we'll get in touch with them and see if uh, they'd be interested in joining us. Actually, Daryl, I'm thinking of building a Cryptex cache this winter. As soon as uh, Christmas is over and I've got some time to sit in the shop, I was uh, I was going to start putting one together. So I'll let you know how that goes. Yeah, that'd be great. Now, did I lose you? All right, I think we're back up, but I don't really see anything. Is everything uh, working for you over there? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you see me, though? Yes, I can, I can see you twice. Okay. <laughs> you still have a second session. as you, You're you starting to take a breath, and you pause. Oh, nice. <laughs> and it's telling me a uh, mic is hardware muted, so we've got something uh, weird going on with uh, Google Plus tonight. All right, well, we'll move on. In any case... Now we'll go to a piece of to set up a multicache of three or more legs. At some point, you could have an NFC tag give the final coordinates to the cache. Others would still be able to finish by following an alternate set of clues, so everyone would get to stage two, and the NFC-capable cacher would go directly to the final, while everyone else would go to stage three, four, etc., before getting to the final. Just an idea that occurred to me while listening. That's a great idea. Um, I'd love to be able to try that. I've I've got to get some NFC tags and start playing with them. Well, and that is a common uh, uh, way to handle things like uh, chirp caches out here. So it is uh, kind of a proven technique and uh, definitely a great way to uh, turn off. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, Look for Geo of Richmond, Virginia, said via email, on election day, mind you, I just finished listening to your randomized six podcast about finding containers and good hiding spots, and I thought I'd tell the story of when I almost stole my own cash by accident. Oh, I got to hear this. Back in 2004, when I visited my nephew in college, about 300 miles from where I was living at the time, I hid a few cash containers around the town for his fraternity to use as scavenger hunts, team building events, etc. Because they were specifically for their use, I didn't register these on geocaching.com. A couple of years after he graduated, I found the fraternity was no longer using the caches, so I contacted a local cacher and told him he could adopt them and publish them if he wanted to. Fast forward to this fall when I went back to a football game. I used a zip code search on geocaching.com to pull up a map of all the geocaches in the area and didn't see any icons for my caches, but thought it would be fun to see if any of them were still around. Lo and behold, I did find one, and since it was a micro, I decided to reuse the container and put it in my pocket. When I got back to the hotel room, I opened it up to see how the log had held up after all these years and discovered it was an active cache. It was then that I found out if you're not a premium member, those caches won't show up on the maps. I had to make a special trip back out there to replace the cache. I think I'll spring for $30 before I make my next trip out there. (laughs) Yeah, there are some tricks around that, uh, but you have to have someone give you the uh, code to, you know, the URL actually, not a code to Mm -hmm. uh, get into the logging for that. So it is, you know, it is possible. But yeah, that's one of the things that's kind of a little bit... uh, uh, freaky if you don't have that premium membership is you can get caches that don't appear so especially when you're trying to hide that's when it really gets you know bothersome to me mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. is when you're trying to hide a cache and you find out, well, someone populated like five premium only caches in that uh, park or whatever that all in, you know, just you can't do anything with it, uh, you know, because that's saturation is too high. Yep, exactly. And now we have another comment from uh, Lafitte FL of Florida, and he had a, a gift idea for the experienced cacher, and that's a UV flashlight. He's noticed that uh, caches in his area are popping up, which require a UV flashlight to find the cords to the next stage. This is um, this is an item most cachers probably don't have in their cash bag until the need arises, and they aren't very expensive. Mm-hmm. And that is true. You can get some uh, cheap ones, but uh, if you want to get a good one, they can get uh, pretty darn pricey. Uh, you know, I've got a stream light that I really like. That's actually a multi-use flashlight uh, with a couple of different wavelengths, and that is something that uh, you do have to watch out for. In some cases, the UV wavelengths are uh, too long, I believe it is, and they don't fluoresce a lot of the things that require the UV light. So there's a few different wavelengths, and that can be a concern. But you know, if you're just getting one of the cheap ones, you should be okay. But uh, I like you having probably, the multiple yeah. wavelengths in mine because one of the things I do is I turn it to the uh, like brighter, the closer to a uh, whiter light. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I'm searching for the cache, because it does a nice job of lighting up the area without turning you night blind. Ah, I got gotcha. you. Know, and you're probably only going to use a true UV flashlight, what, two, maybe three times? If finding yeah. caches, so you know, an inexpensive one is it will probably do the trick. I don't have one personally, so if anybody wants to send me a UV flashlight, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> you need to put together like a uh, Amazon wish list uh, kind of thing and let people uh, start buying you gifts off of it. There you go. Well, continuing on this feedback train, Jr. and Juju of uh, Roswell, New Mexico. There's a place I need to visit. Uh, I love your show and GSAC. I back up my GSAC to Dropbox. That way I can use it on multiple computers and the secure backup is also is always available. And you can also back up to Google Drive if you have that. So, great tip. Yeah, there's a bunch of uh, different services. And you know, we might want to do a show at some point about ways that you can use uh, Dropbox uh, alone. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that we do for the show is move our files around through Dropbox and it's uh, shared directories. So if you had multiple people that you wanted to share your GSAC files with, you could even set up that kind of stuff that way. So there's mm-hmm. all kinds of cool things that you can do with uh, Dropbox and it's well worth checking out. Yeah, I use Dropbox to share um, pocket queries with friends of mine who don't have a premium account. So, same idea. Yeah, well, it's great for setting up uh, things like events if you're going to be uh, creating custom caches and mm-hmm. want to set out the uh, 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 GSAC files or the individual uh, GPX files from each of the uh, caches if you want to start putting together uh, docs that way, you know, all kinds of stuff. If you're planning trips, it's a, another great way to do that is uh, uh, put together your uh, um, GPX files and drop them in there and everyone can load them, mm-hmm. you know, any kind of uh, map files, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, Dropbox can really be indispensable, especially when you're working on group situations. Exactly. And it's not just Dropbox. Google Drive, uh, Microsoft SkyDrive, uh, Box.com. Or is it box.net? It's box.com now. It had been box.net. Okay. But some are better at uh, sharing than others are. Uh, And you you can get uh, some really nice features out of some of the others that you you don't have on Dropbox. So it's one of those things that you you use the one that fits best for you, but Dropbox Mm -hmm. is the one that uh, we use most often around here. We should probably do a show or or stick it into a randomized show, the... uh the best ways to use Dropbox. Yeah, probably. Well, let's get on to uh, another couple of bits of feedback. And uh, first one is from Schneider of Iowa, who emailed, I was a Cash Maniacs listener, and now I'm enjoying the Geo Gearheads podcast. I have one question. When will the shows be out of beta? It seems like most of the kinks have been worked out by now. Obviously, I'm joking, but in a way, I'm kind of curious. 
Well, if you're watching the video from this one, you find all the kinks haven't been worked out quite yet. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, the bear also wrote in uh, via email and said, "I'm sh I'm bleh, excuse me. I'm sure there are many who are wondering when does Geo Gearheads lose its beta label? I was under the impression you were waiting for Hangouts on Air, but you've done several shows with Hangouts on Air, and still the label remains. Can you give any insight on what's remaining?" And uh, yes, we can. Uh, we do have some other things that we were trying to work out aside from the uh, Hangouts on Air, and obviously we're still having some glitches with Hangouts on Air, but we also wanted to get the logo done, uh, some stuff to the website, and some other kind of cleanup stuff that we've not been able to uh, nail down. So, uh, you know, if we still don't have anything done, we're probably going to lose the... Uh, uh, beta tag at the end of this year, so the first of uh, 2013 will be beta-free shows. Beta-free, but full of beta carotene to help your eyes. Uh, I don't know if we want to do that. Oh, that might be sorry. a little bit too much bandwidth. Oh, okay, and a little too orange, but you've got that covered tonight. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so with that, why don't we get into the drawing of the names for those great gifts? There's a lot of names in that box tonight, Daryl. There are. I think I had counted about 30, so that's uh, pretty awesome. And our first one is uh, DeBear of Lenore, North Carolina, for his email question on Beta 45. So, DeBear, you'll get to win the Geomate Junior with Update Kit. That comes from Geomate for Geocaching, brand 44, Colorado. Congratulations. Yes. Our next winner is, as I pull it out, Search Jaunt of Belgium. Well, and that's for his email comment on Beta 46. Well, Search Jaunt, you'll get the Explorist, or the Magellan Explorist GC. That's a great little uh, GPS there. Congratulations on that one for sure. Mm -hmm. And next winner is doo, doo, doo. oh of course it has to be a, a hard one to pronounce raft y r a f t of arizona for his email feedback on beta 44 and for that one you'll get the geomate junior large log cache i'm kind of jealous cuz i like that one it's a good looking cache. I mean, it's one of those that you're going to put out and people are just going to simply overlook it. Yeah, but I wonder if in Arizona he's going to have the right kind of territory to oh, actually good point. hide that. He might not have the right kind of wood. Yeah. All right. So for our next one, it's Nighthawk 700 of Baltimore, Maryland with his voicemail feedback on Beta 44. Well, Nighthawk 700, you get the Geomate Gnome cache. That's one I've been uh, really looking forward to, actually. Uh, yeah. If you move that cache out. around, will that be a roaming gnome? I think it would be. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't put it on the page because you might get sued. <laughs> All right. And our next one actually goes to uh, uh, someone who just uh, won one, actually. It's the bear of uh, Lenore, North Carolina again for his voicemail feedback on Beta 44. Wow. He wins two? He wins two. See, that's Boy, the that's... advantage of actually uh, calling in multiple times. So what's he going to get? He gets from the Cashamaniacs, that's you and me, Daryl, the 1,800 milliamp hour USB battery. That's a very cool one. And we, you know, everyone that uh, got one of those earlier on, because we actually gave some of those away initially, mm -hmm. really seemed to like them. Mm -hmm. And now, no name yet, 202 of Huntsville, Alabama, got uh, the next one from his voicemail comment on Beta 46. And no name yet. We should give him a name, shouldn't we? Uh, I think his name is going to be 202. Oh, no name yet, 202. He's half a 404. He also gets an 1800 milliamp hour USB battery. All righty. And now, hey, we just had this uh, fellow on the show uh, with his comment. It's TNT of Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, but this one's actually for some email feedback back in beta 44. Well, great. He is going to get one of the trackables and some puzzle pieces from the 2012 geocaching block party. 
Well, that's pretty cool because I missed that uh, altogether. And our next winner is Lafitte FL of Florida for his email feedback on Beta 44. And he had more feedback just tonight. Indeed now, he did. Lafitte FL is going to win a 2011 uh, Daryl W4 and Firefly 03 Geocoin. I assume you uh, you haven't uh, logged those yet, Daryl. They're uh, no, they're, they're they're unactivated. They're unactivated. Okay, good. <laughs> and, and they do have the uh, glow in the dark firefly butt. Oh, nice! One of the features that they, uh, a lot of people like. All right. Well, I think I'm beginning to think that our box is uh, a little biased here because the bear gets another ge- uh, prize for his comment on this edition of Geo Gearheads. Oh, you know. If you give a lot of comments, we'll pay you for those comments. Devera, you are also going to get a 2011 Daryl W4 and Firefly 03 Glow in the Dark Geocoin. And our next one is Haikuin of Orlando, Florida for email on Beta 46. And Haikuin wins a Cache Maniacs limited edition Geocoin. Now, that one is a black geocoin. That's a really nice, high-quality, limited no, edition. The, the oh. limited edition is the copper geocoin. The uh, black ones are the regular ones. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Copper geocoin. Copper, yes. All right, uh, next we have JRN Juju of Roswell, New Mexico, for their feedback on this episode. On this very episode, I read it. He gets a Cache Maniacs geocoin. Oh, they, since it's JRN Juju. Exactly. All right, and for our last winner of the evening, we have Nighthawk700 again <laughs> for his email comment on Beta 47. And he also wins a Cashamaniacs Geocoin. Well, but awesome. You know, we got, uh, we're all winners. Yeah, we got a lot of uh, entries and a lot of people who actually got mm-hmm. some prizes and a couple of people who got a lot of prizes. <laughs> Well, it pays to uh, vote often. Yep. Vote early and vote often. That's vote, what I'm Yeah, vote early, vote often. There you go. And uh, everyone who uh, did get a prize today, make sure to email us at geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com as soon as you can. I think the uh, cutoff is two weeks. I'd have to double check on that. But uh, email us as soon as you can with your mailing address so we can mm-hmm. get the uh, prizes out to you. Or uh, in some cases, actually pass the... Uh, information along to whomever is going to actually be shipping the prizes. Exactly. If you don't, we'll just send you an email photo of the prize that you could have won. (laughs) There you go. That's a good way to handle it. (laughs) All right. So let's get back into the uh, feedback. And uh, we're going to go back to uh, No Name Yet 202 of Huntsville, Alabama for his comment via email which was, I was wondering if you could go into some detail about the different stats generators out there. I've seen FindStat Gen and Badge Gen for GSAC, as well as MyGeocachingProfile.com. And there's some free standing programs like CacheStat. Are there others? Uh, which do you use, if any, and why? Now, one well, of the things that uh, I will note, though, is CacheStat is Windows only and needs the .NET framework. So that is a Windows uh, program, standalone program. Uh, but that one is out there. And the one that I've actually used a few times uh, for cache stats is the uh, GC Statistics, which is a uh, Linux, uh, Mac OS, and uh, Windows app. Uh, but really, since... They've started putting that stuff into uh, geocaching.com on the uh, premium package. I haven't touched any of those. Exactly. That's the same, same with me. I was using FindStat Gen, the macro for GSAC. Um, and in fact, I see a lot of people still using it. It gives a little more detail than the uh, geocaching or ground speak uh, stat generators. But, you know, for the most part, I'm happy with the... Uh, with the one that comes through the premium membership. Yeah, definitely. And I have played a little bit with that uh, mygeocachingprofile.com, which does Mm -hmm. use the uh, live API and has some really cool information. And uh, I do like playing with that. It really seems to be uh, uh, in development still, and I'm looking at some of the uh, cool new features that it's coming out with. 
and I'm really uh, looking forward to playing with that one more as it develops. But uh, uh, you know, it does have some useful information, especially when you're looking at more specific types of things and trying to compare it with other people, including your ranks overall. So that is a nice one to uh, play with. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've played with all of them, but I end up going to the uh, the one at the website because you don't have to do anything more. I was going to say, I don't know that you played with all of them, because I'm sure there's a bunch of them out there that we've never well, even all, uh, been able to All the ones that grab. we mentioned. There you go. Okay. All the ones we mentioned. <laughs> that's, what I, that's the all of them. That's, that's the subset I was working with. Okay. That works for me. <laughs> hey, Geo Gearheads. This is Andy Lehman from northern Indiana, and my question is for the Randomized Show. Is there an easy way to geotag and see your pictures on a map? What I'd like to do is kind of take pictures of caches and things like that, but I'd like to be able to see the cache information on the page as well as the, you know, some, an easy way to keep all of this in a good location so I can see the pictures, the cache information, my logs, things like that. That'd be a great uh, topic. So if you guys have any information on that, I'd love to hear. Uh, thanks. Again, this is Andy from northern Indiana. Well, there's not anything that I can think of that would make this uh, really quick and easy. The um, tool that really was probably best at this was mm -hmm. the GeoJournal Mac app, but that one has been abandoned. Uh, the last release was March 7th of 2008, uh, so that one was pretty darn old, and I don't think it supported uh, geotagging at that point. But that does pretty much everything that he wanted to do. There are some other tools out there, like uh, Every Trail, that will let you mm -hmm. put the stuff together. There's a bunch of apps for uh, iPhone that I've seen that let you put together, like travel journals, so some of that stuff might work. But as far as getting stuff automated, I don't really think I've seen anything that will do it automatically. I haven't heard anything that will do that, so we're going to have to come up with something. Yeah, maybe that's a, a good tool that someone could come up with. Uh, again, another use for the uh, API uh, you know, log your uh, mm -hmm. uh, caches. I, you know, I would think that if you could either upload or attach your photos, maybe through like even Flickr, if they were geotagged already, uh, you can match the information from that through the uh, uh, cache log information. Though that might not really work because you don't have the times and everything. But you know, do you do them as multiple overlays on a Google Map? Yeah, you know, there's so many ways that you could do it. it but really, probably the best thing to do would be to have an app on your phone that handled all of your geocaching that would also handle the uh, uh, logging and then could you know, do it that way because then it would have the information about what time. You know, field notes have the uh, information about what time. So maybe even if uh, you upload your field notes through this uh, web app or something like that, you could uh, come up with a tool that would do it. It's possible. That, uh, that's a good one. So yeah, if you might guys be, know, uh, got to let us know. Send us your feedback, and uh, let us know if you have a way to uh, to do what Andy's looking for. Yeah, it might be a good one uh, for a developer to take on if uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they really have some time and wanted to try hacking something that's pretty cool. Could a GSAC macro do anything? In you'd have to pull external could. pictures and you might be able to. Yeah, yeah, I'm, that's why I, kind of why I'm thinking you almost have to have it tied into you know, some kind of photo service where it could get the uh, photo information. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm sure you could do something. Well, we have more feedback. So let's jump to Ed to Ed of Hertfordshire, uh, UK. I have a technical question for the next random I show. I want to know how the geocaching.com website works out the current location of a trackable from the TB's activity log. You would think that it takes the events in chronological order, but that doesn't seem to be the case for my TB called Cats Friends Dash Lucky. That's uh, TB 4999F. The website says that it's in a certain cache. Let's call it Cache A. I, to save German pronunciation embarrassment, and thanks, Ed, I appreciate that. And indeed, the log says it was placed there in April. However, in May, someone moved it to cache B without ever having it logged out of cache A. And on the same day, it was logged out of cache B. I would expect the TB to be in the hands of the person who logged it out of cache B, but it's not. 
So if you followed all of that, can you or any of your listeners explain why the trackable is still showing on geocaching.com as being in cache A? Uh, is there a bug in geocaching.com code or some hidden logic that I just don't see? And by the way, the most recent discover log seems to indicate that the travel bug is not actually in cache A. Thanks for your help, and uh, if you can give any, if you can shed any light on this. All right, you might want to uh, go back and check out uh, beta episode 15 when we talked with Mountain Bike about travelers. That might give you a little bit of uh, good background, but there's several ways that I can think of that this might become an issue. Uh, one of which is when you place your logs on geocaching.com, they're displayed in date order that the log was said to have been submitted, but not the actual date it was submitted. So it could be that someone went and logged after the, uh, uh, with an earlier date, after the person who said that they dropped it in the right cache. So that's probably what happened is my guess, mm -hmm. because it doesn't take a whole lot to get that mixed up when you're going through that kind of uh, uh, inconsistencies with dates. Right. And that, that's a very logical explanation. Um, Odd, odd, though, that somebody picked it up and logged that they had it, yet it's still in the, uh, in the first cache. It is, but it's not that, it's not that bizarre because you know, I don't know if there's really a way to go back and look, but if you did, I'm thinking you'd probably see that someone somehow moved it and there used to be a way, and I don't know if it still is available for the owner, and I thought for the cash owner to say move to the last location. So if the cash owner thought it was in the cash, or thought it wasn't in the cash, and had checked on it, he could go and actually move that, but I think they might have eliminated that, and now it's only available to the um, owner of the traveler, not to the cash owner, and the cash owner only has the option to uh, uh, mark it as missing. And, you know, I didn't have any travelers in any of my caches that I could check that out, and I didn't bother to go back to even see if I still have the option to move to the last known location. Um. Well, as I'm looking on geocaching.com right now, as an owner of a travel bug, I have the option to grab it from somewhere else, is the term. Well, that's that's available to everyone. As long as you okay. have the uh, code, you can always grab uh, rather than retrieve. Okay. So if, if it's in someone else's hands, you have to grab, you can't retrieve. So if they didn't officially log it out of the cache... You can still right. grab it and pull it. Right. Or okay. if it wasn't in the right cache, you can do the grab, that kind of stuff. Right. So I don't see anything here that's going to point that out to me. That's interesting. Yeah, it, there's a number of different scenarios I can think of, so I'm not really sure which one's which, but to me the most probable mm -hmm. is going to be that logs were submitted out of order with the correct dates for the actions, and it just got bumped into the wrong spot because someone logged it you know, with the uh, right date with an earlier date on a later date. Is that confusing enough? <laughs> I don't know. Do we have time to talk about the time? I, I'm sure we have some time. We have lots of time. Okay. Just maybe not time in this episode. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, so lots, lots and lots of stuff there. Okay. But, yeah, I, I, we couldn't tell you for certain. I did take a look at that particular traveler. It, unfortunately, it's uh, just something that can happen. Mm -hmm. Figuring it out uh, probably isn't worth the effort. I would just go uh, grab it from wherever it is and do a note and drop it into the, you know, write a note on that cache, drop it into the cache, and then delete the note from the uh, cache. That's just something I like to do to keep the cache pages clean. I don't like seeing the bug drops on there. Oh, that bothers me. Yeah, and that will remove the note, but still keep the uh, uh, traveler mm -hmm. in that cache. So that, mm -hmm. that, to me, is the cleanest way to fix it. Hi, Geo Gearheads. This is Jersey Eric from Central New Jersey. I have a question about cross-listing a cache. 
I'm curious, do you or your listeners who hide caches on geocaching.com cross-list them uh, on other sites such as opencaching.com always, sometimes, or never? I personally always cross-list the caches that I hide because I consider it additional advertising for the cache. My rule of thumb is to list the new cache first on geocaching.com until it has an FTF. Once that cache has an FTF on geocaching.com, then and only then do I list the same cache on opencaching.com. My reasoning for cross-listing is that there could be someone out there who was just introduced to caching through opencaching.com, perhaps through its free smartphone app. And for me, it's so easy to submit the cache on opencaching.com, either by importing it from the gc.com listing or entering the cache manually using a cut and paste. Thank you. And remember, don't step in the mud. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you never know what's there. in the mud. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I actually don't usually cross-list. If I do a cache on one of the other sites, I do cross-list it because around here we just don't get much traffic on anything but geocaching.com. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I stopped doing the cross-listing is there are a number of cachers around here who do actually watch those other sites. However, if the cache is cross-listed, they won't find it, period. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I have cross-listed a couple of my caches, but it's when opencaching.com was new. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Let's see. You know, the cache had been found, you know, let's say 25 times by uh, geocaching.com members and maybe two by opencaching.com. So I stopped cross-listing. Yeah, it, it's not uh, something that I found uh, really helps all that much. However... Around here, it's not going to get listed if or get found more than like once or twice if it's listed on anything but geocaching.com. So I just don't really do it. You know, I can, mm -hmm. I want to do it, but unless it's something really interesting, I don't cross list anymore. Uh, I you know I, again I want to to kind of drive traffic to those sites, but it just seems to be a losing battle around here. Yeah. I like opencaching.us uh, for their different types of caches that aren't available on geocaching.com. So I'll use those. Yeah, yeah, I definitely like that. I, I, I have done the uh, virtuals on uh, .oc or .us, .us. Mm -hmm. yeah, the North American site, because it is something that you can't do anymore through right. geocaching.com. And... I hate to say it, but I don't like challenges. Yeah, I want to like challenges, but it just mm -hmm. seems like it's uh, such a wreck that I don't want to even try to set one up. And you know, I just did a challenge, uh, shoot, a week ago maybe, that's been there for months. I couldn't tell you how long exactly, but it's it's been months. And the... Uh, challenge has only been found twice and it's a really really quick easy one mm -hmm. so you know that that's one that you'd think a lot of people did it's, it's in a mall it's so easy to go you know while the rest of the family is shopping mm -hmm. grab this quick cash and it, they are a quick uh, challenge and just no one is doing it so yeah. it's just another good reason to uh, you know not do challenges on my last big hiking trip, uh, we found, I don't know, 12 caches. There were, I looked ahead, there were a couple of, of challenges on the way. So I went ahead and did them, but only because I was there. Uh, there was no cell phone reception, so I couldn't have looked them up when I got there. So it's one of those things that I don't often check, but if I think of it, I'll go ahead and look. Yeah, well, and one of the problems too is you don't have one app that does everything. Right. Yeah, that's why I don't typically go out and do Munzies and geocaches because until you had CacheSense, mm -hmm. you had to go switching apps or you had to have 
the GPS doing caches and your phone doing the Munzies. So it's one of those deals that the switching back and forth is enough that it takes the fun out, so I didn't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd pick one or the other. If they could somehow merge the challenges into the official geocaching app, because that's the one they own, mm -hmm. I think uh, challenges would be more popular than they are right now. I still don't think they would get much love, though. No. So I think that's where we're going to draw the line for this show. We still have another three comments that uh, came in that we wanted to hit, and we'll hit those again next week. And we've got some uh, information that we wanted to talk about ourselves, and I'm sure by that point we'll have even more. So join us next week as we talk about that and whatever else you guys want to uh, send in along the way. Check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, as we've shown in this episode. So leave us feedback by calling 206 350 3647, by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. Geo Wattenberg. This show is copyright 2012 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved.